Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Kimberlea, and if you've never been here before, nice to meet you. And this is another holiday homicide, but if you've never met me before and you like true crime and you like true crime from the perspective of someone with a psychology and sociology degree, as well as a law degree, that is me. If you wanna know more about me, you can look in the description box, but let's get into this gruesome and terrifying holiday homicide. I'm not new to YouTube but I'm new to true crime and I haven't really found my flow yet. It's really hard when you go into different categories and I've loved true crime for a really long time. So one of my really good friends, Courtney said, Kimber, why don't you have just a little bit of wine? Loosen up a bit. So that is exactly what I'm going to do today. So cheers. The victim in this case is Michelle O'Dowd. And this murder took place in Jacksonville, Florida and it occurred on the night of December 1st, 2011. Whenever I hear about murders and whenever I think about these kind of things, I always tend to think back about what I was doing at that time. And it's so hard for me to think about the juxtaposition between what I was doing and what happened to this woman. Everyone talks about, you know, where were you on 9-11? It's the same thing. So if you remember where you were in December of 2011, let me know in the comments. I would really, really like to know what you were doing at that time because this was a very pivotal moment for me. I actually lived in Jacksonville for eight years while I was in law school. And I had actually just had my daughter, Shyla at the end of October of 2011, October 28th. So this was Shyla's very first Christmas. And I remember we spent it with family and with her dad's family and my family. And looking back, this was such a beautiful time for me in my life. Even if I have to go back to Facebook or Instagram, I always like to connect with a victim on that level and find out what was going on? Who was I? What was I thinking about? Sometimes it's the only way I can connect with these victims. So Michelle O'Dowd was a 67 year old woman and she was originally from New Jersey. She had graduated from college in Virginia and she worked in the medical industry for over 30 years as a hospital lab technician, and then she actually graduated to become a lab supervisor. I really, really love to paint the picture of the victims because a lot of times we don't get to know a lot about them. Sometimes I like to know about the killer as well. I'm really fascinated, especially with why these people do what they do, but she was actually a fraternal twin. She had a twin brother named Philip Jr. Her father's name was also Philip, and actually she ended up having a son, and she named him Philip as well, but he tragically passed away suddenly in 2003 at only 29 years old. So this woman was already dealing with some tragedy and hardships in her life, and that's actually why she ended up moving to Florida. After that tragedy occurred, she moved to Jacksonville, Florida to be closer to the family she had left, including her fraternal twin, Philip. Michelle's brother operated a business that offers automated answering and communication for multifamily communities. I did not know what that was. So essentially, I learned that since 1992, they're an after hours answering and marketing on hold service provider. It's an answering service. So when you call somewhere after hours, you know, veterinarians or um, in this case, apartment complexes, you would use their services to record those messages so that you wouldn't lose potential customers who may have questions after hours. The name has actually changed to Active Answer and in Jacksonville, they were located in the Regency area. And it was on Regency Square Boulevard. And this is a landmark in Jacksonville. This is pretty much the only mall in that area. And I used to visit this mall all the time. As a matter of fact, this is where I bought all of my Christmas presents that year. So it's, I don't know, it's weird to think about it. Like it happened so close to home. I have so many memories from this area of town. It's kind of creepy to think how close I was to everything that was going on. Right there. But when Michelle did move back to Jacksonville, she was actually retired, but she decided to go back to work probably to have something to do, some social life, and a lot of people who do retire end up going back to work. And she worked for her brother's company. She was working for the accounts receivable and collections. Michelle was actually known to many people to be very generous, loving, caring, 
and she was affectionately known to her family and those close to her, especially her nieces and nephews and her grandchildren, as Aunt Mickey. She sounds like somebody that I would get along with. She was 67 years old, but she loved animals. She had a little tiny dog named Max, and she was very devoted to Max. She was always taking him wherever she went, and she walked him uh, numerous times a day. Anytime she got the chance to go out with him, she was out walking her dog in the neighborhood. So she not only loved animals, but she loved helping people, and she was described as someone who was very motherly and liked to rescue people and... Um, I definitely know these type of people and sometimes I am like this. If I see somebody in need, I just am compelled to help them and this might be the motherly nature that she had and maybe she felt compelled to do this because she did lose her son at such a young age. But this definitely can be a bad thing as much as it is a good thing. But after Michelle didn't show up for work on Friday, December 2nd, her brother got very concerned, especially because she wasn't able to be reached. He actually went over to her home around 10 o'clock in the morning, and when he got there, the door was wide open. Okay, that's scary. That's, that's scary. But he walked in, and he realized that her entire house had been ransacked. And of course, he began to call out for her. He was like, Mickey, Mickey, are you home? Are you here? And okay, I know he's a guy, and I'm a girl, obviously. And I don't know if there's a difference between the way that men react to these things and women, but I know if I saw an open door, and maybe it's because I watched so much true crime, but if I saw that and I saw the house being ransacked, I would call the police. I would not go inside. I would right away step out. Don't touch anything and call the police. But since it is a family member, I probably would go inside because it's someone I love. I want to find out what happened, but... In any case, he went inside. I also think about stumbling upon a body. Every time I read about or watch a show about a murder, I always think how frightening it would be to just be doing your everyday activities and then stumble upon a dead body. It's actually one of my biggest fears. It may not be a rational fear, and I hope it never happens to me, obviously. But do you ever think about that, or is that just me being morbid? I don't know. Her brother doesn't actually see anything when he goes into the house. He sees, you know, overturned furniture, looks like maybe a struggle happened, looks like things have been thrown all over the place, but he doesn't actually see his sister. And the dog is there. That's another thing. Obviously, the door being open is cause for concern, especially when you have a pet. I mean, I know I have three dogs. I don't ever, like if the door just opens a little bit, I'm like, no, <laughs> ah! and I run to close my door. I'm terrified for my dogs to get out. So Phil knows she would never leave her house this way. And as a matter of fact, her house is completely decorated for Christmas. It is December 2nd, but she had a ton of gifts underneath the tree. So family and friends explained that this was her favorite holiday. She was so generous and so giving, and probably because the loss of her son. She really enjoyed making her nieces and nephews and all the kids in her family so happy. She had done all of her Christmas shopping already, and like I said, tons of Christmas presents just beautifully wrapped underneath the tree. He also noticed that her car was still at the house and that means that she hadn't left unless somebody took her. So he's frantically looking, but now kind of wondering, was there some foul play? I mean, obviously with everything thrown around, yes, but she has to be somewhere, right? Unless somebody took her. So he continues to search the house once, twice, and then on the third search, he does a more diligent job. I think maybe he might have calmed down or maybe he was even more frantic. But he finally makes his way around the house and he was turning everything upside down looking for her, like I said, more carefully. And that's when he notices an empty vodka bottle on the living room floor. And this seems out of place. It was out of character for Michelle to have drank a whole bottle of vodka and just throw it on the floor like that. So... As he bent down to pick up the vodka bottle, this is when he sees something. He sees a foot sticking out from underneath the giant pile of gifts underneath the Christmas tree. Oh gosh, that's terrifying. And not only that, he grabbed it. 
I'm thinking, would I do that? But maybe, you know, it's your family member. You want to know if you can help. Maybe she fell. She was decorating the Christmas tree. I mean, I don't know if the first thing I would have thought about was murder, but I don't know. Putting two and two together with the ransacked house, I might have. But either way, he grabbed her ankle and she was ice cold. Ice cold. At this point, he picks up the Christmas presents one by one and he uncovers the battered and deceased body of his sister, Michelle. So here's her body buried underneath the Christmas gifts that were intended for the people that she loved. That's so morbid to me. It makes it worse when I hear things like that because the way that this killer positioned her body is so much worse considering they could have done anything. They could have, you know, hit her under the bed. Michelle had multiple injuries to her face and her head and was later found out that she was not only beaten severely, but she was also strangled. Her face was covered with a dish towel and then with the Christmas presents. So if you've ever watched true crime, you probably know that a lot of times or most of the time when a murderer takes the time to cover the person's face, it's usually a sign that they knew them that they knew the victim and they don't want to look at them. It's like they carry out this crime, they realize what they did, they feel guilty, they feel remorse, and they cover the face with um, a towel, a pillow, something. It's like they just want to kind of forget what they just did. If it was just a random killing, the killer doesn't usually take their time to do this. They kind of don't care. So this was the first sign that this could possibly be somebody that Michelle knew, but the house had been ransacked. So was this a robbery gone wrong? And then it was just staged to look like it was someone close to her. But the mysterious empty vodka bottle that her brother said was not in his sister's character uh, was interesting and they want to look more into that. She lived in a gated community called Grand Reserve. I know all about this area. It's known to be more of an upscale condominium community. And what's crazy is I used to pass this all the time, all the time. And when I did, I would always think to myself, could I ever afford to live in an area like that? Because when I first started law school, I didn't have that much money and it was a gated community. So you needed a gate code, even though, I mean, how many times have we followed behind a car? I don't like to do that. It gives me anxiety. So I don't, and I always tell people not to. And my, when my friends are like, just, just, just follow someone in. I'm like, no, I'm not the type to follow someone into a gated community. I don't know. So investigators start to wonder how this person gained access to Michelle's home. There was only one car that wasn't accounted for when they showed the gate footage to the community and it was a 2001 white Kia. So they have a lead there and then when they find Michelle's purse, they realize that her debit cards were missing. So this was finally a break in the case now because they could track down where her debit cards were used if they were and then maybe they could see someone in the bank cameras because we all know that banks usually have cameras at the ATM. So. so that's exactly what they did. They found out that Michelle's debit cards had been used three times in the past 24 hours. And to me, that is just stupid. When this happens, I always think, does this person really think that they're not going to be caught? That the camera is not going to see them? Are you that? I mean, I don't know that mindset. I just don't know that mindset because I would, I don't know, maybe it's just because I have really bad anxiety and I'm not a criminal, but my dad was. He was in prison. Sorry for another day, but I would really like to get his opinions and perspectives on these cases as well because you've got someone with a criminal mind and I just don't really think like that. But do you think you're going to get away with this? There could be fingerprints at the ATM. I don't know. So the first two transactions are withdrawals and they equal $1,000. And then the third transaction was actually declined. I mean, a round of applause for Jacksonville Sheriff's Office because this was less than 24 hours later and they already had all of the footage from the bank cameras. And lo and behold, this might be surprising to you, it was a woman, a woman on these bank cameras. Now, women, <laughs> yay for us being women, we're not usually murderers. I mean, it's just a fact. You know, men are usually killers and women are the victims. But we don't know at this point if this is, you know, the killer. This could be someone in cahoots with the killer. Um, you know, they could be carrying out this crime together. But I think it was a little bit shocking for them to see a woman on camera but she was wearing a big hat and clearly trying to disguise herself. So she was going out of her way, 
you know, big hat on and really trying to disguise herself from the camera. She knew the cameras would be there. So again, I don't know, to me, dumb criminal, dumb criminal. And then this person looks up into one of the cameras and you can see her chin, a part of her mouth, a little bit of her nose. Why would you do that? Here you are going out of your way, going through the trouble of wearing a hat. Why would you, okay, you're disguising yourself, but then you look up at the camera. Why? Dumb criminal award. And if you're part of my VIP community, you can actually use the dumb criminal award emoji below in the comments. So here's someone that knows that they're being recorded and they're so desperate in my opinion for this money, they're gonna do it anyway. So that's a motive because if you watch true crime, people do this for less. I mean, people carry out murders for hire for $1,000, $10,000. That always gets me too. I'm like, what? And they, you, you're gonna do that for money but you could spend the rest of your life in prison and not be able to use the money? What's going on here? <laughs> Again, don't have a criminal mind. So to me, it just doesn't seem worth it. But the other thing is this person has to either know the pin for the debit cards or they must have forced Michelle into giving those codes to them. So since Michelle's family is really close with her, they decide to ask if they can identify the woman in the video. And sure enough, uh, Michelle's adult niece and nephew, they recognize the woman. And it's one of her friends, and her name is Patty Michelle White. Her middle name is literally the name of the victim, her friend. The family at first can't believe this. They don't believe that Patty could have had anything to do with this because she was very well known to the family. She had known them for years. And this was a 40-year-old woman. <laughs> and then I can't help think about this because I'm almost 40. I'm going to be 40 in about a year and a half. And I don't know about you, but... <laughs> I don't know if she's just looking rough, but I don't feel like I look as old as this woman. And when I'm watching these type of murder mysteries, especially if they're from a while ago, like the 90s, I go, wow, 40 really hit different back then <laughs> because I don't know, but maybe life was just really rough for Patty. You know, she was, she was looking rough. She was desperate. She was committing a crime. So... The family's thinking this must be a coincidence because Patty is actually someone who babysat for some of Michelle's nieces and nephews. She did like odd jobs for Michelle on a pretty regular basis. So maybe it was just a coincidence. Like she was helping get some money out of the ATM. Wishful thinking because, um, no, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't put it past anyone, even though it's her friend. You've got this person who's potentially a murderer and they had been babysitting your family members. She was actually the ex-girlfriend, Patty was, the ex-girlfriend of one of Michelle's adult nephews. So they had dated for a while, and then when they broke up, Michelle remained friends with Patty, and it seemed like after the breakup, Patty went into a downward spiral. She didn't have a steady place to live, she did not have a steady income or a steady job, and it seemed like she was just moving from place to place. She was definitely in financial ruin and not financially stable. And again, Michelle's son comes to mind and I think to myself, you know, Michelle's son, Philip, would have been around the same age as Patty and maybe those motherly instincts kick in and she thinks, since I can't do things for my son, I'll do them for someone else and I'll feel like I'm helping a child or someone in need. That's sad. I'm a mom and I know what that's like and that's sad. But it turns out Michelle did give Patty a place to live at her place and it was in exchange for helping her run errands and things like that while she was at work. And Patty did know the gate code because she lived there. She probably had a key or knew how to get in and out of the house. So it's really starting to look like, it's pretty obvious to me, but it's really starting to look like that. Patty could be the culprit here, especially because we find out she owns a 2001 white Kia. Oh, Patty. Bye. So at this point, there is no question. Jacksonville, JSO, as we call them in Jacksonville, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office knows that this is, this is Patty. So get this, so funny. Michelle actually has a sister, our victim has a sister named Patricia. So not only did Patty share the middle name with Michelle, she shared the first name with Michelle's sister. Those things mean something to me, I don't know why, 
but they do. I mean, in this case, it's bad, but Scott, my fiance, his mom's birthday is the same as my mom's birthday. And then my friend Amber shares the same birthday as both of them, August 13th. So it has nothing to do with this video, but it's kind of interesting. Patty only lived with Michelle for a couple months. And then only a month prior to finding Michelle deceased, uh, something in the relationship went south and Michelle told Patty to leave. And then friends say that for this to happen, there must have been something really bad because Michelle's not one to do this to someone. So, so at this point, police have to track Patty down because she's kind of one of those people that doesn't have a place to live. They look to see if there's a trail of where she used the ATMs. And lo and behold, she uses them on basically like a trail to where she ends up in South Carolina. She has family in South Carolina and she takes a road out of the city of Jacksonville and up toward that area. And you can tell by where she used the ATM. So this was what's crazy. Literally the next day, I mean, this case was solved pretty quickly. Literally only the next day after the crime, the police track Patty down. She's in South Carolina with her mother and they're just driving around in the white Kia. And her mom's driving, she's in the passenger seat and she tells Patty, oh my gosh, I'm being pulled over. Can you imagine? You're just casually taking your daughter on, I don't know, an errand or something and you're getting pulled over because either your daughter's a killer or investigators assume that uh, she's involved in a murder. That's, I don't know, that would be crazy. So of course, uh, investigators arrest her and they're gonna take her in for questioning. And they really want to get to the bottom of the motive because with all of the trauma to Michelle's face, they know that this is usually a sign of rage and anger. So they want to ask Patty why. Why did you do this? So Patty says, I don't believe all this, but let's just hear her out. Patty says that she drove from South Carolina to Jacksonville with just the intent to rob Michelle. She just wanted to rob her and not to kill her. She didn't plan to kill her. She was driving all the way from South Carolina because she was desperate for money. And I mean, it was the holidays. I don't know details about her life, but we know she was down on her luck. So she she's just there to rob her. That's it. I disagree but I'll get into that in a moment. Um, and then there's other observations I definitely disagree with, with my background. But Patty just says, I was desperate for money. That's it. But I disagree. I disagree with this confession, Patty, because you mean to tell me you drove all the way back to Jacksonville, the middle of the night, to just rob a friend of yours and the time you did it and everything, it doesn't make sense to me because she knew this woman. She knew her schedule. She knew that she worked. She did this on a Thursday night. She could have waited till the next day when Michelle was at work during the day. She could have gotten into the house because we know she got in the house anyway, right? Because her confession was that she waited until Michelle left to walk her dog to sneak into the house. But wouldn't you just do that during the day grab her debit cards, but I guess the debit cards had to have been in her purse. But if you knew she was gonna walk the dogs, why not just run in, quickly grab her debit cards and leave? Cause you would have accomplished the same thing, getting the money. So I get it that she knew maybe the purse wouldn't be there the next day when Michelle went to work, but I don't know. To me, that doesn't make any sense. But police are suspecting that she had a way to get into the house and she walked into the house when Michelle was walking the dog. And then there was this psychologist. And look, I don't have a PhD or a PsyD. I was in school to get my PsyD, but I do have a background in psychology because I have a degree in psychology, even though it's a bachelor's, but I've been fascinated with the human mind and taken a lot of classes, done a lot of reading and researching and even studied abnormal psychology in college. And um, I disagree with the psychologist. She said that she felt this killing was impulsive and that it wasn't premeditated. I disagree. I, I totally disagree. I think this was premeditated. I don't think she just went into a crazy rage out of nowhere. What do you think? No, I think she was there to harm her. I don't think she was just there to steal something. I think that she was very angry at getting kicked out of the house, uh, about not having money, about being down on her luck. And I, I think this was a revenge killing. I mean, I definitely think she was also there to rob her and take her stuff, but no. I do agree with the psychologist that covering the face with a towel indicated that she had some kind of remorse or guilt. I believe that. 
because we know that. We know that killers that do that usually don't want to admit or like they're feeling guilty about what they did and she realized what she'd done and just, you know, I don't want to look at her. I don't want to think about it. But what I really don't agree with was the next observation and opinion of the psychologist that said that the fact that her body was positioned underneath the Christmas presents was significant. I don't think so. I really, really do not think so because here's the deal. We know this lady is sloppy. She's not only sloppy with her life and what's going on, sorry, but she's sloppy with <laughs> looking into the camera and she spent the night there. Her car was seen coming out of the complex the next day before Phil came there and found the body. So she spent the damn night there. When do you think she consumed the vodka? This is her. Murders her friend, sits back in the living room, looking at the Christmas lights, imagining, what would my life be like if I wasn't a loser? Sorry, I know I'm being judgmental, but I'm critiquing her right now. And she's sitting there with her vodka. No, no, no. She conveniently was like, I don't want to look at that. I don't want this to be <laughs> thoughts of murder. And I want the ambiance to be of beautiful Christmas lights and presents under the tree. So, um... I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to break my back or anything to drag her into the other room. I'm just going to, like, here she, where it falls, it stays kind of thing. I'm just going to cover her up <laughs> with the presents, sit back, have my vodka, chill, pass out, and then deal with everything else tomorrow morning. That's what I think. I think she would do as a lazy bitch. That's what I think. The psychologist said that she thought this was done because she envied Michelle, because she wasn't able to afford these gifts. And I don't disagree. I know to some degree that she was jealous of the life that Michelle was living, and we'll never know exactly why, but we can make observations and say, you know, Michelle had way more than Patty. But I just don't think this is a really significant placement of her body. She doesn't end up taking anything else except for the debit card. So she leaves everything else behind. Again, to me, that's like, why wouldn't you take things to sell? And then that makes me think again that this was a premeditated murder. Because if you were there to just get as much money as you could, what do you take jewelry, electronics? You have a car. You could have just simply taken things out of the house. I mean, maybe that was a little obvious. But still, you only take the debit cards. And when everything was said and done, it was $1,000 taken out of the account. So you, you murdered your friend for $1,000 with the potential to live your life in prison for the rest of your life for $1,000. No, that's just dumb. Friends of Michelle say that she would have given her the money if she would have asked and been really desperate. Michelle would have just given it to her, especially if she knew her life was gonna be on the line. And this is the type of crime that I absolutely find to be senseless. Like when you hear the word senseless, this is senseless. There are so many ways to accomplish the same thing, getting $1,000. So many ways to accomplish that without killing someone. Senseless, it doesn't make sense. So Patty confesses, she waives her right to a trial. It really annoys me when they do that. I guess maybe I would too if I was guilty, but mm, we don't get to find out more details, but she says the motive was just, I needed money. She's charged with second degree murder and three counts of grand larceny for the debit cards. Now you might be asking why second degree murder? Why not manslaughter? Okay, because this crime murder happened during another felony, which is robbery. So therefore she goes up to second degree murder and not manslaughter. But I don't agree with the second degree murder. I think it should have been first degree murder. I don't believe criminals when they tell me like, oh no, I just, I was just going to, you know, rob her. They said there was no evidence that it was premeditated. I disagree, even though I'm usually on the defense because that's what I did in law school, more defense work. But no, I think this was premeditated. It can happen in the blink of an eye. So how can you say there's no proof that this woman didn't plan this? She had all that time in the car. No, to me, I don't trust a criminal. But again, no trial, second degree murder, three counts of grand larceny. All right. The reason it, it bothers me when people waive their right to a trial is because we don't get to know all the details. I always like it when we find out more because there are investigators and witnesses 
and expert witnesses, and we get to piece together more of what happened. Like psychologists come in, and we get a chance to really know everyone involved in these crimes. This is the same thing with the Chris Watts case. I don't know if you're following that. If not, where have you been if you're watching True Crime? But there's just so much speculation because it never went to trial. Chris was guilty. He pled guilty. There was no true investigation. I mean, obviously, they did a great job figuring everything out, but there's something different to be said about a trial. And I think that's why the Chris Watts case is still so fascinating. I mean, not only because we don't have a lot of the pieces to put together, but because it seemed like a normal family. It's like, could that happen to me? And then it's someone close to the victim. We just don't know more about Patty. We don't know if drugs were involved. We don't know what what transpired with their relationship. We don't know where the anger came from, where the rage came from, what Michelle could have said to Patty. Not that that matters because there's no reason to do this to someone. But nevertheless, regardless of all that, Patty was sentenced to 45 years in prison. What are your thoughts? Another holiday homicide. Why do these things happen? I mean, it's senseless to begin with, but during the holidays, I'm guessing, I mean, even I'm not like rolling in the dough this Christmas. I mean, this has been a really hard holiday season, I'm sure for everyone. But to be that desperate, I don't know. And that's why I wish we knew. I, I just wish we knew more, but we don't. So what are your theories? If you enjoy these videos, consider subscribing to my channel. Also, don't forget to follow me on Instagram where you can see behind the scenes of what I'm doing um, with my life, my family. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in my next video.